great and God is greatly to be praised. Thank God for this day. We have never seen before, realizing once this day is gone, we shall never see it again. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. In the old thought and adage of the seasoned saints and my late grandmother who raised me, it is just another day's journey. And we are certainly glad about it. Y'all know what I'm about to say, like, comment, and share uh, this Bible study with your friends and your sphere of influence, and let them know that Bible study is happening here at the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, Fayetteville, North Carolina. I pray your week has been a blessing so far. It is hump day, and I'm glad you stopped by to chill out with us for a few moments as we continue our Bible study. Again, do not forget uh, to like, uh, to comment, and to share. If this Bible study has been a blessing to you, I'm sure it will be a blessing uh, to somebody else. So don't hoard uh, all of these spiritual blessings, uh, but share them uh, with those whom you believe will benefit as well from what we are attempting to do uh, in this study. Uh, before we go forth, uh, because I want to leave you with the word, <clears throat> I don't want to have to make any announcements, uh, but I uh, we have uh, been looking at uh, the numbers and uh, things are looking a bit better. Uh, and as soon as we see that there is a consistent decline, a consistent uh, decline, and we can get back uh, in that worship space the way we want to be, uh, then we will definitely keep you updated on that. Y'all please pray for me and y'all pray for all of our church families. Uh, I know, I know, you know what you would do if you were me. I get it, but please be patient uh, and pray that God guide us uh, with uh, understanding, with prudence, and here is the word for tonight, and wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. Uh, we're going to look at James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8 tonight as we continue our study on the book of James entitled Faith and Public Life. And yes, the subject matter uh, is pointing us to the direction uh, in telling us that if we claim to have faith in God, then our faith ought to be lived out in everyday public life. Um, that is not enough just for us to say, I have faith in God. It's not enough uh, for us just to make a profession and a confession. Uh, but it ought to show up in our practice and our conduct. That is the argument James is making throughout uh, his book. And we are just trying to uh, emphasize a few of them uh, in our study. So do me a favor uh, and turn your Bibles or your smart device to James chapter one. Uh, and we're going to look at verses five through eight today. James chapter one verses five through eight. You already have the outline uh, for verses, for chapters two through five, uh, but we look at that, we're still in James chapter one right now, verses five through eight. James chapter one, verses five through eight. A very simple, quick and practical lesson tonight, but I want you to please, please, please uh, listen carefully uh, to what I believe the Spirit of the Lord saying to the church in this study. James chapter 1, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. 
He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Wow. That was James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. So before we deal with that, let me give a brief review to get us caught up. Last week, we was in James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4. And in James's own way, he talks about how in general and how by and large, all of us are fractured people. Uh, and the mission of God in our lives is to repair us and to make us perfect. Perfect is the language James was using in verses two through four. Uh, and perfect in this context means to be complete, uh, to be whole, and to be consistent. Uh, because the reality uh, that may sound harsh, but is humbling, is that all of us are a bit more compromised than we would like to admit. Go on and admit it. If you don't admit it to us, admit it to yourself. James done pulled the cover off of all of us and pulled our card. James is letting us know that all of us are a bit more compromised than perhaps we like to admit. In other words, we all have our contradictions and perhaps even our forms of hypocrisy. But God's will for our lives is that we grow and mature so our lives can be a reflection of the Lord Jesus. So James makes it very clear to us that life is hard, life is difficult, and because of that, we must learn how to navigate and be productive even through trials and tribulations. And a life we must live this life, uh, though with trials and tribulations, <clears throat> we have to have a proper perspective of those trials. We must have the proper perspective of those problems. Therefore, since we would not be able, we learned this last, last week, since we would not be able to escape the inevitability of trials, we have to learn to endure our trials and not just endure our trials, but endure them with the right kind of attitude. All right, that's what, that's what, we, that's what we've done discovered so far. We will experience trials, we will experience problems and situations and circumstances, and even the context of this book is written under persecution. James is saying that is gonna happen. So since we cannot, uh, James is saying, I'm not going to promise you that you will escape them, but I'm trying to teach you a different perspective so you can have the right attitude as you endure them. James is saying, don't trick yourself. Don't, don't play mind games with yourself as if you're not going through anything or you will not go through anything. Endure it with the right perspective. Uh, I, I didn't plan on saying this, but it, it sounds comical, but it's a true story. Uh, I remember when um, uh, we was uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, a young man at our church had broke his leg, right? He had broke his leg and he was on this faith journey and um, he had broke his leg. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, you know, I hope they get that, that cast off your leg pretty soon. And you know, uh, and you get better so you can get back to work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he says, uh, I'm believing uh, by faith I have this, you know, cast off my leg real soon because, and I quote, the devil is trying to make me think my leg is broke, end quote. He says, I believe by faith. They got a cast on his leg. I mean, it's, it's broke. I mean, it's is broken several places. He got a cast. He can't even walk. Uh, he ain't even on crutches at this time. He's actually in a wheelchair when we're having this conversation. And he says, the devil trying to make me think uh, my leg is broke. James is saying, no, no, no. That's the wrong way to go through it. He said, don't deny it because denial is never a spiritual response to life issues. No, no, don't deny it. Don't think you can escape it. 
and don't think your positive energy means you won't go through anything. James is saying, since you cannot escape it, the devil is not trying to make you think you're going through a pandemic. The devil is not trying to make you think uh, that you are going through valleys and storms. No, you are experiencing a pandemic. So James is saying, since we are in it, we must have the proper perspective to endure it. So as a consequence, James says to us that we should be able to praise God in our problems. I know that sounds real charismatic, but James says, count it all joy. We ought to be able to be joyous in our problems because according to James, it is all about what our problems is producing in our lives. In other words, since trials are going to come, God can use your trials to mature you and God can use your trials to grow you up. There is no such thing as a mature saint that hasn't been through nothing. So the question is not, listen to this, the question is not, will you go through it? That's not the question. The, qu the question is, will you grow through it? Did you hear what I said? The question, James said, no, I ain't asking, are you going to go through anything? James said, that ain't even, ain't even trying to waste your time like that. So the question James is asking us is not, will you go through it? But the question is, when you go through it, will you grow through it? grow through it and if you see growth and if you see maturity in your life james is saying that is worth shouting about i know you want to shout over cars and cash and clothes and cribs and bentley's and bugattis and bmws but he says no you shouting at the wrong time shout because you have matured because if you would have went through this at another time in your life, you probably would have uh, uh, thrown in a towel and said, I can't make it. But you have matured as an individual. And he said, that is reason to get happy. Because you got a whole lot of folk with a lot more money than you that have lost their minds. I remember doing that economic downturn a few years ago. Millionaires, people who thought they had it together was killing themselves and going into depression and uh, because they was losing it all. But James is saying that you can go through things and still keep your head because of everything you went through or because of everything you go through, you can grow through. Uh, that is worth, that's, that's very tweetable. That's very Facebookable. It's very TikTokable. Everything you go through, you can grow through. I thought I was tired, but when I get to talking, I start feeling a bit preachy. But I don't know who I'm talking to. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that I don't care what you are going through, that you can grow through it. You can come out of it better than you went in it. And you can look back over your shoulder and say, I rather not had went through it. I rather not had to, to experience that. And I don't know what it was happening in my life. And I still do not know in retrospect, why did God allow that to happen? Or I still don't know why that happened. I, I don't claim to be a theological giant to be able to explain everything that goes on in my life. Or well, you can explain everything that goes on in your life. But you can say that even though I don't know why, I can say that I'm better because of it, because I learned a lot about myself and a lot about God in the process. Let me drop it in your lap one more time because I just like how it sounds. Everything you go through, you can grow through. I'm trying to move on because it's Bible study. And I got three points I want to get to you. But there is somebody who needs to hear that. 
because you've been trying to find comfort and solace in one day it's going to be over. You've been trying to find comfort and solace that trouble don't last always. And that is true. Trouble don't last always, but you don't want to waste trouble by not growing through trouble. You don't, you don't want to waste your life not maturing and growing and just waiting until you come out of it without being productive while you're in it. I promise y'all this ain't what I come to talk about. I promise you, but under the option of the Holy Ghost, here is God's word for somebody tonight. The first one was, this. it, it ain't on the screen because I didn't give it to him because I didn't plan on saying this. Everything you go through, you can grow through. And you do not have to wait for your season to come to be productive. Talk Timothy Dave Carruthers. So you do not have to wait for your season to come to be productive. Because what a lot of us do is we sit around and wait for our season to come. Have you ever heard that? Child, my season is on the way. Can I, can I help you? You are always in a season. You are, you are in winter. You are either in spring. You are either in summer or you are in the fall. You are always in a season. But don't waste your winter experiences looking forward to summer. But ask God, how can I make myself better in the season I'm in, in anticipation for the season I'm looking for? Okay, let me give you a side order of Bible. I did not give this to the ABT because I didn't know I was going to talk about this. Please, y'all forgive me. But this is what Jeremiah says. He says, he, he, he is talking on behalf of God. He says, uh, somebody that remembers the chapter uh, put put it put it in the chat for me. Put it in the chat. He says, uh, "I know," says the Lord, "the plans that I have for you, thoughts of you to prosper you, thoughts to do you good and not of evil." I think that's Jeremiah twenty nine. Somebody can hit me out in the text. But then that is that is what we like to quote. That I know the plans. I have towards you. We like, we love that, that God is going to prosper us. But what we miss in that text is how God starts off Jeremiah 29. We miss it because God starts off Jeremiah 29. Y'all just flow with me, if you will. I got a little Pentecostal in me. All right. So this is what our Pentecostal brothers and sisters will call them. I'm just flowing in the Holy Ghost. What we miss about that text is that before Jeremiah makes a promise from God that God will prosper them, listen to how he starts. He says, listen, listen, don't listen to your prophets who tell you that you're going to come out in just a few days. Don't listen to your prophets. And I'm paraphrasing when they tell you to turn around three times and shout your way out of it. Jeremiah tells them, you are going to be here for a while. He tells them that you will be in exile for at least 70 years. So here is the question. God has plans to prosper you, but what are you going to do while you in exile? What are you going to do while you are in the problem? What are you going to do while you in the situation? And James is teaching us that while you go through it, Grow through it. This is what Jeremiah says. This is the advice he told them. Listen, you're going to be here for a while. And I know I, I know you have your prophets telling you it's not going to last long. Then Jeremiah says, do not listen to the dreams. This is interesting. That you cause them to dream. In other words, they're telling you uh, what they know you want to hear. But he says, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. Build houses, plant gardens, have children. He says, that, that's what you do since you're going to be here for a while. Uh, build houses, plant gardens, and have children. In other words, 
In other words, check this out. You can be productive while you in problems. You can be productive in your place of pain. You can be productive even while you're going through it. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody can testify. I don't know who you are, but somebody here can testify that even while going through it, I didn't rest on my laurels and talking about I'm going to wait until God bring me out. But I reached deep down inside myself and I was productive even in the place of my pain. Huh. And that is what James is telling us, that as you grow and as you seek to be productive, Count it all joy because it's producing patience in you. It's producing a type of perseverance in you. It is growing you up and it's maturing you so you will not be an entitled individual, but you will be a grateful individual knowing that God is your ultimate source. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, let me get back. So listen to James. With all of that I just said, listen to James. Listen to James. When you have this proper perspective and praise God and have this type of undescribable joy with problems, it is because you know that it's producing patience. And during this process of maturing, in patience, James says, the point is to make you perfect, to make you complete, to make you whole. Now, I want you to show this uh, for me, and I want you to think about this. So with that in mind, listen to how James ends or concludes James chapter 1, verse 4. James chapter one verse four i got you i got you james chapter one verse four he ends with these words lacking nothing lacking nothing so james ends we talked about this last week in james chapter one two through four in verse four of james chapter one he ends with the words lacking nothing so let's look at this in context let's look at this in context so you would not be in lack is what james is saying if you have this mature attitude about testing and trials all right you would not be in lack you would not be in lack if you have this attitude or the right attitude of testings and trials. He says, I want you to remember it. What James said in James chapter one, verse number four, listen to this. And let endurance have its full effect. This is the NRSV version, so that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing, lacking in nothing, nothing. What is nothing? I won't be in lack of nothing. Be in lack of what? So he ends verse four with lacking nothing. But look at James chapter one and five. If any of you lack. Verse four, he ends it with saying, if you let patience have her perfect work, you will lack nothing. That's how he ends verse four. But he begins verse five says, okay, even though I just said you won't lack nothing in verse four, if any of you lack, lack what? There it is, wisdom, wisdom. So James is connecting our perspective of suffering to wisdom. So in order to have the attitude he talked about 
in verses two through four, you got to have wisdom. Got to have this type of, you have to have the right mindset. So the attitude James suggests we have in verses two through four starts with wisdom. And conversely, if we do not have this attitude, it is because we lack wisdom. That's why he opens up five saying, and so if you lack wisdom, even though I said you won't be in lack, but just in case you lack wisdom, ask God. So we are, or we get enthused and we get excited, but according to James, enthusiasm and excitement does not make us wise. And a lack of wisdom can lead one to a temporary burst of excitement and optimism in certain situations, but it do not last long because our perspectives change when our circumstances change. Did you hear what I said? That without wisdom, your boast of optimism and enthusiasm can be temporary because when our circumstances change, then our enthusiasm is going to change. Wise people, according to James, rejoice in trials instead of rejecting them. That's what James said. He says, wise individuals who have grown through their situations rejoice in trials instead of rejecting their trials. So, of course, we shout when we get happy. But James is saying, you know, learn how to praise God when things are a little hectic as well. Not denying it. I ain't saying you're always happy, but have a sense of understanding that God is in control. But the reason why we do not have this type of joy, except if things are favorable, is because our viewpoints are limited and our perspectives can be lowly and our perspectives can be carnal. So if we are going to be able to find joy in pain, James is saying, we must learn to be wise. So here's the question. Here's the question. Here's the question. All right. Ready? The question is, how in the world do we get this type of godly wisdom? I want to be wise. I, I, want to, I want to grow. I want to have the proper perspective. And James is saying that your perspective is connected to your wisdom. And sometimes your wisdom is grown through the things you go through so you can know that God is doing the work in you. And it's not just about what God is going to give to you. So we need this wisdom. This wisdom is very important. This wisdom is important for our sanity and for our psychological and spiritual well-being. So James is saying you need this. Because if you got this, you will lack nothing. Context. And he's saying you won't lack uh, uh, you will be rich. That ain't what James is talking about. We say it's lacking nothing, but you would not lack joy. You would not lack this perspective. You would not lack a sense of maturity. You know, see, so you got to watch that. The Bible says that if you count it joy, you ain't going to lack nothing. You know, so you, you just name it and claim it and call it and haul it and blab it and grab it and believe it and receive it and look. That ain't what James is saying. James is talking about wisdom. Wisdom. So how do I get this type of godly wisdom? Number one, this is, this is a doozy. I need y'all to hear this one. If y'all don't hear nothing else, get this one. How do I get this? Admit you don't have it. Yeah. The first way you get this, the, the, the first way you get this, this type of wisdom, where you would never lack the right perspective of trials and tribulations, where you can be a well-rounded, whole, full, well-integrated human being, is that you have to admit you don't have this type of wisdom. You have to be humble enough to say to yourself, I need to be wiser. I come to worship, I come to church, but Lord, I need to be wiser. I teach Sunday school, I read my Bible, I can quote scripture, 
But Lord, I need to be wiser. The way you get this perspective, the way you become wiser is that you got to admit you need to be wiser. Meaning that even if you do have a level of wisdom, you have to know that all of us still have our blind spots. And those blind spots ought to keep us humble enough to keep seeking God for more wisdom. More wisdom. Here is the dangerous part of this. The dangerous part of this. Okay. Um, Try to say this in a nice way. You can be wise in your own eyes. But God makes it clear through the prophet Isaiah that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God says through the prophet that my ways are higher than your ways, which means what the Lord Sometimes when the Lord is having his way, sometimes when God is having God's way, you know what that probably means? That means, let me flip it, let me flip it. When you are not having your way may mean God is having God's way. Lord, have your way in my life. Okay, really? Lord, mature me, grow me up. I want to have more patience. I want to have more endurance. I want to be more loving, really? Is that what you want? So sometimes it takes stuff and trials, and that is okay. You will not escape those, and it will develop this type of wisdom in you. I don't even like how this sounds, but sometimes God will allow <laughs> some adversarial personalities in your life to keep you on your knees. Yeah. See, y'all trying to act funny. So y'all act like the only tongues y'all know how to speak in is uh, those spiritual tongues. But I wish I could be with y'all when somebody cut y'all off in traffic. Ooh, I wish I could hear y'all talking to y'all best friend about that coworker that get on your nerves. I bet you know how to talk in other tongues. It just ain't spiritual tongues. I, I know, but what will happen sometimes is that those adversarial personalities will drop you to your knees and what will happen when those type of personalities enter your space you will say to yourself if they would have called me about two years ago have you ever said that it oh but they, they better be happy now here it is this is what we say they better be happy i'm saved as if saved people don't cuss y'all be tripping whatever Tell that to somebody else. They better be happy. Now, what happened is not that you got saved. What happened is in your salvation, you matured. Because what happens, people have got, this is wisdom. This is what wisdom has taught me. That when you allow adversarial personalities that enter your life to make you react to their adversarial type attitude. See, I'm telling you, the enemy is sly. Because in James chapter three, it talks about demonic wisdom and godly wisdom. We'll get there. That's in James chapter three, it talks about demonic. I think that's our last, the last thing we're going to deal with, demonic wisdom and godly wisdom. And that's dangerous because even though it's demonic, it's still wisdom. That, 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 James calls demonic wisdom. And what demonic wisdom would do is that when those antagonistic and adversarial personalities into your life and then you respond or you react what happens then the focus does not be on how wrong they were but it'd be how you overreacted and then you will actually have people feeling sorry for the demon because you reacted to the demon in a harsh way does that make, had that ever happened to you? Have you have you ever been fed up to your wits end and you went to work the next day saying, if they say something to me today, yeah, okay, yeah. If they, to, today, they got the right one today. It's raining outside and I waste Kool-Aid on my dress, bet. And then it happens and then you get home and be like, oh my, now temporarily you feel good. Sometimes when you get that off your chest, you be like, ooh, 
That felt real. But then in retrospect, you done lost your job. In retrospect, you done messed up your reputation. And they looking like the meek, humble lamb because that is what dev- uh, or, or demonic wisdom looks like. But there is no one more dangerous than somebody who is foolish and think they're wise. You ain't seen a danger. No, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Ask for it. But in order to uh, or, or admit you don't have it. So if you admit you don't have it, you are acknowledging that you need more of it or that you are lacking some. But there are those individuals who would never admit it because there is a such thing, as I said, as being wise in your own eyes. And you ain't seen somebody crazy that's foolish and think they wise. Have you ever? Yeah, okay. I ain't never met one personally, but I, I seen something on TV. And the ones I see on TV, they swear up and down. They, this wise sage who got all the answers. That's number one. Anybody that got all the answers is foolish. Anybody that think they got all the answers is foolish. Never, ever. Hear me. I probably should put this out because I'm giving, I'm, 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 I'm giving my card, but never, ever trust anybody who rarely says these words, I don't know. If you've never heard them say, I don't know, in a real way, you may be dealing with a foolish person that think they're wise. So you got to admit you don't have it so you can get it to learn how to deal with individuals like this and to discern it. Everybody that says, Lord, Lord, it's kind of like Donald Trump holding a Bible backwards in front of a church, reading from 2 Corinthians. Y'all remember that? Admit you don't have it. Number two. Number two. Number four, Verse five. Ask for it. After you admit you don't have it, ask for it. God wants you to have it. God wants you to have it. So if you want this wisdom, you and I must ask God for it because only God can give it. Here's a question. Here's a question. Are y'all feeling me? I'm going to look up and see if y'all feel it. Narcissist. Who said that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a whole Bible study of his own. Yeah. Narcissist. That's exactly what it is. Ask for it. Ask for it. Check this out. Because either you're going to be wise. God God is just dropping. God is just dropping. Either you're going to be wise from godly wisdom or from demonic wisdom. Spiritual wisdom or carnal wisdom. And whether you function in divine or in the demonic, and when I say demonic, I don't mean head rolling around, foaming at the mouth. I don't mean a long tail and a pitchfork with horns coming out of your head. No, 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 no. That ain't even a biblical depiction of the demonic. Don't let Bugs Bunny and Warner Brothers fool you. No, no, no. The devil come in with three-piece suits calling himself a preacher. The devil wears skirts all the way down to his ankles with two-inch heels, with a big hat on and a tambourine. Don't don't let it fool you. The difference between whether you function in spiritual or carnal wisdom, divine or demonic wisdom, all based on who got your ear. Who do you listen to? James going to deal with this later on, too. Who, who has your attention? Who been talking to you? Who you listening to? Because you're starting to sound just like them. Okay, all right. Matthew chapter 6. I don't know if y'all remember this, but in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, 
um, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, but before he teaches them how to pray, I believe I probably mentioned this a few months ago. He says, uh, okay, let me teach you how not to pray first. Don't pray like the hypocrites and heathens. And I can imagine the disciple like, I, I mean, I, I don't pray like, I pray three times a day. I am a devoted Jew. I, I pray as a lifestyle. And Jesus is telling individuals who has a lifestyle how to pray, he telling them they've been praying wrong. He says, let me detox you of this heathenistic, hypocritical type praying you've been doing. And I believe what Jesus was telling them is I ain't calling you a hypocrite. I mean, I called you all. You all are my disciples. I'm not even calling you a heathen. He says, but I guarantee you, if you trace your rituals and if you trace your habits back, hypocrites and heathens taught you to do what you're doing. So you are so embedded with this heathenistic, hypocritical way of functioning, you think it's wise, you think it's spiritual, when it's really carnal. That scared me. I, I don't even want to teach no more. That scared me. That you can be functioning so long the same way because you've been listening to the same people and think it is divine and it could be demonic and not even know it. That's why you have to be wise and ask God for the wisdom and God will expose to you. Man, I got so many stories uh, of somebody doing, people doing crazy stuff, talking about some God told them to do it. I got so, but I ain't gonna bore you with that tonight. But but I, I'm, I'm telling you that you can convince yourself and you, people can convince you that they are functioning with divine direction and convince you it's divine because they have infiltrated your spirit and it has shifted your attitude. I know some people who used to be the sweetest people that ever, whatever I'm trying to say, that ever lived. And then the wrong person got in their ear and affected their decision making and their wisdom. And you can be convinced that it's God. Are y'all hearing me? You can be, if God had to detox his own disciples from this carnal type of wisdom, that means your pastor, that means your bishop, that means your leaders, that means you, Yes, you even need to be detoxed of some stuff and unlearn some stuff that you thought was God. You know what that's called? You know what that's called? Here's the big word. Y'all forgive me. I'm going to use a big word. Y'all know what that's called? It's called maturing. To look back over your life and say, I wasn't as wise as I thought I was. And I need to unlearn. You know what that's called? That's called growing. And nothing can grow you up like going through some stuff. And them same folk that was dumping all that mess in you, nowhere to be found when you're going through. And you realize that that was not divine behavior or spiritual behavior, but carnal behavior. This is how the Stoics define wisdom. This is interesting. It's very simple. The Stoics define wisdom as this. Knowledge of things human and knowledge of things divine, end quote. I like that, it's simple, but I like it. Because what that says to me is that wisdom knows the difference between humanity and divinity. The Stoics call wisdom knowledge of the divine and knowledge or, or knowledge of things human and divine. Because what it's saying, it is a difference. It is a difference between God's will and our wishes. Wishes, W-I-S-H-E-S, -S. I, I'm tongue tied. Our will, God's will and what we wish. Yeah, let me say that. When I put the E-S on it, it don't sound right. There's a difference between God's will and what we wish. Stoic says that's wisdom. Stoics are saying that's the difference 
uh, or, or that's what being wise is. You know what's human and you know what's divine. And it keeps you from misappropriating scripture. God, you said in your word, you will give me the desire. Listen to this. You will give me the desires of my heart. And you know, I've been wanting that pink Bentley ever since I was 20. Where do I come up with this stuff from? Pink Bentley, I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say. God, you, you know, I've been wanting to be a millionaire ever since you told me, God, that you would give me the desires of my heart. Stoics say that's fine. That's, that's fine. That's, that's, that's fine. You can think like that. But the Stoics will say that you need to know whether that is what you desire for yourself or is that what God desires for you? Because sometimes the question is, how high can God lift you without losing you? Are you feeling me here? So God giving you the desires of your heart does not mean God gives you everything you desire. But that's what it says, right? God would give me the desires of my heart. There's two ways you can look at that. Man, I said I was going to be done at 7.35, but it, it got good to me. Um, there's two ways you can look at that. God will give you the desires of your heart. That's one way to look at it. Or you can look at it like this. God will give you the desires of your heart. Y'all hear how my voice change? It's different. It's one way you can look at it. God will give me the desires of my heart. Or check this out. Or God will give me the desires of my heart. God can give me everything I desire or God can empty me of my desires and give me God's desires. God gives me the desires to desire. I'm talking better than y'all typing in the comment. I, does that make sense? So God giving me the desires of my heart don't mean God looks into my heart and give me everything I desire. But if God sift through my own, and we'll deal with this later in James too, it, God wisdom allows me to sift through my own selfish, petty desires and replace them with what God desires for me. So God gives me the desires to desire. So if God gives me the desire to want to be more loving, God gives me the desire to want to be more giving. God gives me the desire to want to be uh, more, more uh, philanthropic or the desire to be a better person or to desire to help people. It is those desires that God would give me. And when that becomes your desire, maybe God can trust us with a little extra bag. When that becomes your desire, Maybe God can trust us with a little, a few extra coins. But when it's all about you, it is possible you will not function in wisdom like you think you will. Finally, admit you don't have it. Two, um, ask for it. Three, accept it. Just going to read to you John, John, Lord, James chapter one, verses five B through A. And we out of here. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse number six, but let him ask in faith with, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Verse seven says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. And finally, he is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So this type of wisdom is what God desires in our life. James says God gives it liberally. God gives it without reproach. Meaning simply that God will happily and anxiously grant this request. Why? Because it is God's will that you have it. James says in verse six, you just saw it. Don't doubt what you ask now. In faith, with no doubting, because when you doubt, you become, you become conflicted like a wave driven by winds. So you don't know which way to go because you're driven by winds. That's an interesting word picture there. 
the winds of God's will and you're blown by the winds of your wishes. You see that? So when you see, see when you don't, when, when you get this wisdom, be patient because when you ask and doubt and try to move ahead of God, you are, you are um, driven by two contrary winds, the wind of God's will and the wind of what you wish. And James says, when that happens, you become double-minded. You become unstable. Which means you have a civil war going on inside of you. Because literally, that word double-minded means, ooh, ooh, I just got, okay, I'm going to stop. Ooh, something just came to me. That word double-minded means two souls. That's what it literally means. And if you are like the wind that is blown by waves, your double mindedness become obvious to the outside, to the naked eye. So you become double minded. You become sometimey. You do this way, uh, kind of like we talked about Sunday. You talk like this around this person, and you talk like that around this person. You double minded. You are stable. You listening to too many people. You you are like you are like the wind. You are tossed to and fro. So when you ask, don't start making quick decisions. Don't doubt. Just be patient, and God will reveal some things to you. Because if you're honest, all of us have asked God for things before, and we didn't get what we asked for. And you have to be confident that your faith trusts God enough to know that God knows best. How do you get this wisdom to persevere through trials? Admit you don't have it. Admit you don't have it. After you admit you don't have it, ask for it. And then when you ask for it, James says, don't doubt, just accept it. And if that is your mode of uh, of functioning in this life. And none of this is given as if this is easy to do. Life is hard, y'all. Life is difficult. This season we are persevering uh, through is not for the faint of heart. So this is not, I'm not teaching this as an easy fix, but I want you to look back over your life in particular during these times and be able to say that I, I grew through it. I grew through it. I grew through it. All right. Uh, I remember uh, this charismatic preacher used to come on uh, TV all the time. Um, and uh, he was so funny. He's like, watch your ear gate, watch your eye gate. Uh, uh, so what I'm saying today, watch your ear gate. Watch who you listening to. Be careful, watch who you're listening to. That oxen will run it. Watch who you listen to. Be careful who you listen to. All right, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. Because we want you to have a sort of spiritual and divine wisdom that you can be happy and you can be whole, you can be complete, that you will not be double-minded and unstable in all your ways, as James said. All right? Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I, I thank you. I'll be feeling the spirit of the community, even uh, virtually. You know, after a long day, like most of uh, you have had, you know, you, you sit down and want to eat your something. And the last thing you want to do is uh, start talking. Uh, but it's something about these moments. I feel energized. And I believe it is because of the, the spirit uh, of the people God has allowed me uh, to be a part of. So thank you so much. Again, y'all are the only people I, in my life I've heard say go longer. I'm like, what in the world? Go longer. But uh, so hopefully this message was a blessing to you. Again, like, share it, even if they didn't watch it live, perhaps they can catch the replay and be blessed by what the Spirit of the Lord uh, said to the church. Those who have ears, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. Now may the love of God and the justice of God and the sweet communion of God's spirit continue to rest with us, rule with us, and abide with us now, yea, even forevermore, in the name of the Father 
and other son and the Holy Ghost. God bless you. See you all Sunday.